Welcome classic rock fans to an episode of Classic Album Review where classic albums are excavated and explored and today we're looking at Jefferson Airplane's Surrealistic Pillow. When we think of Jefferson Airplane we immediately conjure up that menacing pulse of the bolero uh, referencing Lewis Carroll, uh, clever allusions to the narcotized state. But this number according to Grace Slick was inspired by or written after taking LSD and spending 24 hours listening to Miles Davis's sketches of Spain. The thoughts of this band uh, come attendant to numerous images associated with the counterculture from pop festivals, race riots, napalm, all beautifully platformed by the acoustic drum and lysergic swirl of their music. Music that was, uh, if not forging, certainly celebrating the new musical landscape. I think when Marty Ballin screamed, wake up New York from the rooftop of that hotel in 1968, it was like a clarion call for a new way of thinking. If I may quote Wikipedia, Jefferson Airplane's fusion of folk rock and psychedelia was original at the time in line with the musical developments, pioneered by the likes of the Birds, the Mamas and Papas, Bob Dylan, Yardbirds and the Beatles. Absolutely, but we can't ignore the uh, ideals of folk melded with the darker chords of psychedelia. As I've said, there's no doubt this band are wrapped up in images of uh, the summer of love. Um, referred to by Paul Cantona retrospectively as the Summer of Fucking. Will Hodgkinson, the critic, calls them the first band of the counterculture. Not sure I agree with that really, to be honest with you. But you've got to remember that Surrealistic Pillow also came out, uh, I think it was February 1967, February or early March 1967. Not so much the Summer of Love, more the early Spring of Love, if you like. But it was a lurid and twisted listening experience nevertheless. I think when Grace Slick replaces Sydney Anderson as this band's singer, I think something very seismic happens for this group. I mean, she doesn't just bring over these remarkable songs, but she adds what one critic has described, a kind of Moorish weirdness to the proceedings. I love the way the voices in this band weave together like some strange psychedelic Wagnerian choir. Um, and part of this sound, of course, is Corkin's very snaky lead guitar. His sound is very much defined by a kind of a smouldering blues and stinging tremolo. He said himself that his sound comes from the modal blues of John Coltrane as well as the mesmerizing ragas played by Ravi Shankar. No other record uh, defines very much the, the San Francisco sound of 1967 and this one in my opinion perhaps bathing at Baxter's as well. But it was a time you got these, this hodgepodge of influences, usually albums that were half live, half studio. Happy Trails by Quicksilver Messenger Service. Of course, Grateful Dead's Anthem of the Sun. All beautifully endeavoring to capture the, the, the very soul of San Francisco. Uh, you had bands that were pulling against that, of course, in many respects, like Creedence Clearwater Revival, um, who, who instead were much more interesting, very swampy, uh, blues, very tight performances uh, as well. But this album, Surrealistic Pillow, is modal folk minstrelsy and its acid beat um, certainly defines the, the Bay Area sound, I think, for a generation. I think we're talking about the true pioneers of uh, lysergic music or psychedelic music. I think something like the 13th, 13th Floor Elevators should be right up there, although they hail from Texas, I believe. The Grateful Dead and Jefferson Aeroplane were still operating within the Aswa well, Country Joe and the Fish to a certain extent, still operating with the paradigms of folk and blues. We think some of the influences that make up this fusion, this eclectic mix that is Jefferson Aeroplane, of course, Sidney Anson. Um, it was very much a blues jazz singing and bring some interesting inflections uh, to the sound that's uh, demonstrated on that first album. I think what Grace Slick uh, adds later on is a, a pulsating sense of menace. You had Marty Ballin who was interested in folk but he was also interested in um, pop sensibilities as well. He had a couple of singles prior to Jefferson Airplane songs like uh, Specialise in Love and Nobody But You. But Paul Cantona, he was very much part of that Bay Area sound. He was very much a folk purist. And Yorma McCorkinen was very much a blues player, but yet very experimental. He was uh, trying out different types of effects pedals that became available at the time, which certainly helped define that uh, lysergic sound that's now associated with many of these bands of this period. And we can't fail to mention Jack Cassidy on bass, whose swampy, wandering bass very much def underpins the sound of this band. He was a remarkable, remarkable player. 
And of course, uh, Skip Spence, who is one of the tragic figures of the counterculture, of course, who goes on, I think he goes off from here to form Moby Grape. According to Captain, this song was uh, thrashed out on four tracks in just two weeks. Uh, most of the rhythm tracks were actually cut live in the studio. Whereas songs like She Has Funny Cars, I think, were already in the, uh, being uh, played live by the band before they even got anywhere near a studio. Of course, there's the two grey slick showcases, Somebody to Love and uh, The Wonderful White Rabbit, which, as I said, she'd brought over from the Great Society. But Paul Cantor said even these songs with the Jefferson Airplane, everything was based on the live experience and taking it to the very edge. Interestingly, according to Grace Slick, the Great Society was originally going to be called the Acid Fraction. They eventually changed their name as a kind of a mocking of uh, Lyndon Johnson's grandiose moniker for the US population. Jefferson Airplane were a vibrant live band, there's certainly no doubt about that. And um, there was certainly, there's certainly been noticed by Donovan of all people. In fact, Donovan actually refer references uh, the Jefferson Airplane in his song, Fat Angel, a song that features on his Sunshine Superman album. In 1965, they played the Longshoreman's Hall, and it's there that they are supported by the Great Society. Almost if the, uh, all the, the fates uh, allow all these threads to come together. It was a strange old time, that's for sure. Marty Ballin recalls uh, when the band played the Fillmore, they would throw acid tabs into the audience. I mean, my God, you wouldn't get away with that sort of thing now, would you? But let's not forget LSD was, uh, wasn't made illegal in San Francisco um, by the governor, Ronald Reagan, at the time. It was made illegal in San Francisco, I think it was about October, November 66. It's No Secret, of course, was the aeroplane's first single after they signed to RCA Victor label, which gave them a huge advance. Uh, certainly a huge advance by the, the then standards of the day. But the label was unhappy with their first LP due to the numerous references on there to tripping, which they felt uh, uh, was a little bit too close to the edge. Whether this had anything to do with the, the tensions within the band, I'm not so sure. Signe Anson left uh, in order to raise a family, which seems like a, a very moral, noble choice on her part. Uh, Skip Spence departs, of course, and he's replaced by Spencer Dryden, who, believe it or not, is actually related to Charlie Chaplin. 1967, you had The Gathering, which was a bit like The Human Being, it's instead that Jefferson Airplane, I think, headlined. It was a real gathering of the tribes. I mean, you had you had the diggers who were political activists, anti-capitalist, uh, anti-imperialists as well, as well as uh, uh, counterculture luminaries like Timothy Leary and Allen Ginsberg. Timothy Leary, known as the High Priest of uh, Psychedelia, of course was there to promote his uh, spiritual discovery movement. A lot of people say it'd be wonderful to have gone to Woodstock, but for me, if I had my time machine, I'd love to go back to the Monterey Pop Festival. Of course, we had Bathing at Baxter's, which I think is a heavier sound than Surrealistic Pillow. Crown of Creation caused a lot of fuss due to its sexual references. And we got the wonderful song Lather, which is a song written by Grace Slick about her affair with Spencer Dryden. You get Volunteers, which is a very political album, which platforms the band's dissatisfaction with American politics at the time. It was going to be called Volunteers of America. However, I think there was a charity already called that, which would have objected or did object to that title. For me, it, uh, for me, the Altamont Festival was kind of the death, not only the, the maybe the death of this 1960s idealism, but the end of this band as it just started to fragment after that. We have uh, uh, Corkin and Cassidy go off to form Hot Tuna, which uh, were more interested in recreating or, or delving into a kind of an authentic Americana. They did record a couple of albums after that. There was Bark, I think, which, um, uh, which Marty Ballin had already left by that point, and as well as the Long John Silver album in 1972, which um, caused some friction with their record company due to a track on there called Son of Jesus. We can often think about the band's debut, where the band takes off, so to speak, but it's Surrealistic Pillow, which is the one that uh, um, seizes our attention with its lurid bubblegum pink sleeve and the band posing with instruments they didn't play. The sleeve was originally meant to be blue, but apparently something went wrong with it, the printing or something like that. So they, they stuck with lurid pink. And interestingly, the photograph was taken by a chap named Herb Green. And no, I'm not making that up. As I've said, there's uh, heavy folk elements on this record, which gives it a almost whimsical sound that 
beautifully accompanies the more lysergic or psychedelic aspects of that uh, Bay Area scene at the time. It does lend the music uh, an almost dreamlike quality, probably inspiring Jerry Garcia's uh, naming of the album Surrealistic Pillow. Jerry Garcia was actually credited as being the producer on this album, which is not the, not the case. The producer was Rick Gerrard. Rick Gerrard said that Jerry Garcia only breezed in briefly, added some guitar parts uh, to it, and that is about all. Uh, there was some conflict between Paul Cantona and Rick Gerrard. Uh, Paul Cantona didn't like the fact that Gerrard wanted to uh, layer everything with that kind of Phil Spector wall of sound type thing, which uh, he, he felt would have killed the album. I think Paul Cantona is right, because the production brings out the, the gorgeous tonality of the folk elements on this record. Um, Cantona says that Garcia lent a particular graceful madness to the proceedings. In fact, he was awarded the title of spiritual advisor. The album was recorded very quickly. It was recorded in about 13 days. They managed to secure an appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show and the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. And these were filmed in colour as well, which allowed the band to exploit their very lurid light show. Grace Slick's vocals are wonderful on this record. Her wailing heralds in the new utopia. Uh, Paul Campbell famously said that she was everybody's dream for one good summer. In fact, for a good many summers after that. Anyway, let's talk about some of the songs on this album. I'm not going to talk about White Rabbit. I've done a separate video on White Rabbit and I should put a card up there for you to check it out. DCBA25 is an interesting LSD inspired romp, um, aided I think in its trippiness by its unusual guitar tuning. Uh, it's actually inspired by Albert Hoffman's original Chemical Batch 25, which I'm um, pretty sure was imbibed at the time. She Has Funny Cars, of course, is one of the, the famous ones. An interesting song about American materialism. This was the first song the band actually recorded, uh, arguably the first song the band actually recorded with Grace Slick. My favourite song on this album, as I've said, is a song called Today. Uh, beautiful, haunting, simple guitar riff provided by Jerry Garcia certainly makes this number. And this song was used to devastating effect in the Coen Brothers film Serious Man. Apparently Marty Ballin actually wrote this for Tony Bennett, but I think Tony Bennett passed on it. Paul Cantor's guitar playing on here was articulate and mournful and beautifully platforms that counterpoint guitar provided by Jerry Garcia, as I've said. Coming back to me is a song about how drugs change your perception, yet uh, yet love despite that remaining constant. Uh, and there was certainly a lot of that going on uh, within the band at the time. If you read Grace Slick's um, autobiography, she's rather candid about it. And this song flows with these beautiful light acoustic guitar textures, uh, providing the background along with the uh, organic sounds of a recorder. The recorder was uh, played by Grace Slick, by the way. This is definitely a period piece and it's defined by that very dreamy uh, vibe that's established straight away. It's a reflective number that calls up images of long-haired ladies blowing on dandelions to scatter the seeds of the wind. It was the 60s after all. Three-fifths of a mile in 10 seconds is a bit of a nonsense song combining two headlines of from newspapers but it fits well on an album that very much deals with the idea of changing perceptions. How Do You Feel again is a, another folky number and it taps into the themes of loss and yearning which is very much explored on this record. Embryonic Journey is a, a corking in number I think, a number that he thrashed out before joining Jefferson Airplane. My Best Friend is a song dedicated to Skip Spence as I said it skipped off to join Maybe Great before this album but it has a childish playfulness to it which is uh, very much speaks of his, uh, his um, character. Plastic Fantastic Lover sounds gloriously rude, but unfortunately it isn't. It's actually a song written, I think, about a TV set or a stereo at the time. It's a vibrant song to end the album, although I do think it was a, it's much better live. I think Surrealistic Pillow is a perfect album, perfect for the times, and is indeed timeless in that respect. It's one that I often return to um, every summer and listen to. It's, I, I think I'm beginning to warm more to bathing at Baxter's as being a much trippier experience and therefore that's me, I'm beginning to gravitate more towards that one than this album. Anyway, you've been watching my far out review of Jeff's Airplane's Surrealistic Pillow. I hope you enjoyed that and hopefully you will click like, subscribe and check that bell to get notified of any future uploads as well as check some of the links below this video for other ways you can support the Sterling Work Done a Classic Album Review. Other than that, I'll just leave you with my closing salvo, which, as you know, is hope you're well, staying safe, but more importantly, that you 
keep listening.